This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Welcome to this Razor COVID-19 special. I'm Shini Somara. For six months now, we've been talking about viruses, viral mutations, RNA, and DNA. But how much of that do we really understand? We've gone back to the real basics and asked, what is a virus? Nucleic acids are large molecular structures known as biopolymers that form the essential components of life. They are split into two types, deoxyribonucleic acid, DNA, and ribonucleic acid, RNA. Every living thing on our planet is DNA-based, with the exception of viruses, which can be RNA-based. And some argue that viruses aren't living at all. So what are the roles of DNA and RNA? How are they different? And how do they interact? Both can be broken down into smaller sections called nucleotides, consisting of a phosphate, a sugar, and a base. The sugar separates the type of nucleic acid being either deoxyribose or ribose. In DNA, the base can be one of four different types, adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine, which codes the genetic information a bit like a four-letter alphabet. In RNA, thymine is replaced by uracil. Each base has a singular opposing base to which it can bond, creating what is known as a base pair. Adenine always pairs with thymine or uracil, and cytosine always pairs with guanine. In DNA, base pairs form two complete opposing strands in a twisted ladder known as a double helix. RNA typically exists as a single strand, sometimes bonding with itself to create more stable structures. A living organism's entire DNA is called its genome. For humans, this consists of 3.2 billion base pairs. A person's entire genome is encoded in every cell of their body. It's split across 23 pairs of chromosomes, which exist in the nucleus of the cell. Sections of the DNA code for specific traits, such as height, eye color, and blood type. These coding sections are called genes. They're switched on or off, depending on the type of cell. If they're switched on, they inform the cell's ribosomes to produce proteins, which help provide that specific trait or function. This is achieved with an RNA strand called messenger RNA. Messenger RNA is the crucial link in understanding how viruses hijack cells, replicate, and then transmit. So what are viruses? Viruses are simple structures consisting of a small viral genome of either DNA or RNA, protected by a structural protein. They're also very old. Computational biology has shown that a retrovirus existed 450 million years ago in the Ordovician period, where life existed only in the oceans with mollusks and early forms of fish. There's also a widely accepted theory that RNA viruses predate DNA-based living organisms, known as the RNA world hypothesis. All living things can be infected by viruses. They hijack cells, insert their genetic payload, and try to replicate. In some cases, this can permanently alter the DNA of the species they have infected. A study of the human genome found that approximately 8% is LTR retrotransposins. These are the remnants of viruses in our DNA that were passed down to us before we were Homo sapiens. Although some can be beneficial, viruses are often spoken about and understood as pathogenic or disease-causing. Most pathogenic viruses that emerge to attack human cells are RNA-based. This includes Ebola, HIV, influenza, and coronavirus. The average RNA virus is 11,000 bases in comparison to the 3.2 billion in human DNA. But they can cause huge amounts of damage. 
The reason RNA viruses cannot get much larger is because the enzyme that transcribes RNA for replication, called RNA polymerase, makes a huge amount of mistakes that never get corrected. So larger complex RNA viruses mutate too much to survive, whilst smaller RNA viruses are constantly mutating. RNA polymerase transcribes viral RNA to produce messenger RNA. This takes us back into the cell and where RNA viruses hijack DNA processes. The new messenger RNA from the virus goes to the ribosome, instructing it to produce replications. This repeats with more ribosomes being hijacked until the cell is full of virus replications, causing it to burst and die, releasing the virus to infect more cells. DNA and RNA have a very close symbiotic relationship, which can be incredibly deadly in a very specific set of circumstances. As with life, what is fascinating is how immensely unlikely those circumstances are, that an RNA virus, which has no intentions or motive, can mutate to just the right genetic formula to enter a human host, alter its DNA, replicate, and then transmit to infect another human host, and for that to happen at just the right moment. But it's a case of probability. The chances of this happening and a new virus emerging is increased as humans continue to push back the natural world, populating every corner of the earth and moving more freely with air travel. They are both increasing their exposure to new viruses from wild animals and the risk of transmission between other humans. Without proper planning and containment strategies, including buffer zones between wild and domestic animals, the chances of a new virus emerging and taking hold in human populations, potentially causing the next deadly pandemic, is a case of when, not if. The Director General of the World Health Organization has said we're not just fighting an epidemic, we're also fighting an infodemic of misinformation. For example, we've seen reports that 5G spreads coronavirus, that a vaccine already exists but is not being used, or that alcohol is a cure. Richard Horton is editor-in-chief of The Lancet, a world-leading medical journal. He says we've known the facts about the outbreak since January. The Lancet published five papers in the last week of January. And those five papers tell the story of what has unfolded in the Western world in the recent months. Those five papers described a new virus. They showed that this virus was deadly, that it was related to SARS, that it was killing people and, the, and that the number of deaths was rising, that patients were being admitted to intensive care units and requiring ventilation. Those papers showed that there was no treatment for the virus. They showed that there was person-to-person -person transmission. They explained the importance of personal protective equipment. They explained why testing and tracing contacts and isolating people was absolutely key to controlling the pandemic. And they indeed also warned of the pandemic potential of this virus. We knew all of this in the last week of January, but most Western countries and the United States of America wasted the whole of February and early March before they acted. That is the human tragedy of COVID-19. Thanks to the work of the Chinese doctors and scientists working in international collaborations, all of this information was known in January, but for reasons that are still difficult to understand, the world did not pay attention. SARS was a surprise. It took the country by surprise. And I believe that the Chinese government vowed after the first SARS outbreak that this would never happen again. And I have seen over the past two decades massive investment in hospitals and healthcare in China, huge investment in universities and scientific research. And that meant that when a new outbreak took place at the, in December last year, and China had the scientific capacity and it had the medical capacity to deal with the outbreak. 
And it also had the political capacity because the country understood that the threat of a SARS-like pandemic posed a grave danger to Chinese society. In Western Europe, we looked at this threat in a very different way. We saw the threat as not being from a SARS-like virus, but being influenza. And I think that because we've thought about the risk of a pandemic being another uh, wave of influenza, we didn't take that threat seriously. We thought that influenza is a relatively mild illness, uh, that the virus could pass through communities and that we could generate immunity, which we call herd immunity, in our country, and that that would then protect us. But that was a fatal error of judgment. lot of unknowns about the virus that causes COVID-19. Why are some people severely affected while others only become mildly ill? And why do some have no symptoms at all? The COVID Symptoms Study app is designed to further study the virus and track its spread. The app developed by a team at King's College London and health science company Zoe allows individuals to report their symptoms as they develop and is the largest citizen science project of its kind in the world and certainly the UK. This is the weirdest virus disease that we've ever seen. It can present in so many different ways. We've seen at least, you know, 12 different symptoms associated with this virus. There's probably 20 or 30 and people are coming into these different groups. And until we collect the data longitudinally in real time, we won't really understand the virus. And so we were up and running really before anyone else on the 24th of March, just as the UK went into lockdown and we're able to record an amazing data set. And now uh, we've just crossed the 3 million wow. downloads and users. Lots of fascinating stuff is coming out of this just by the sheer volume of data we've got and the fact we're keeping an open mind on it. Their aim is for people with or without symptoms to download the app, enter some personal details on their demographic and then record their symptoms day by day. So of the data that you've collected, what can you categorically tell us about this disease? It comes in a myriad of forms from incredibly minor uh, symptoms just lasting uh, less than a day uh, to uh, conditions that can go on for weeks, maybe up to a month. Uh, you can have all kinds of symptoms that come and go in phases, which is again, unlike any other disease. Really anything goes. For an individual, it's very hard to do that, but in a, in a big data way, uh, artificial intelligence can, can sort these out into clusters, and that's what we're we're seeing about six types of uh, disease cluster, um, two of them quite severe that end up being quite likely to go to hospital. People know we also looked in the twins and we found that which symptoms you get and which ones you don't is partly down to your genes as well. So uh, that explains this huge variation between people. It's not just your genes, but at least 50% seems to be genetic. They've analysed data from 2,633 identical and non-identical twins that use the app. Through this, they found roughly half of the differences in symptoms between individuals can be explained by underlying variations in their genes. While the rest is due to other factors, such as the amount of viral exposure, viral load, underlying health conditions, environment and lifestyle. And every day we're learning something new because People are inputting new data in there and we're adding new symptoms every week. Uh, some more going up tomorrow about skin diseases and uh, other things like this. We're adding new drugs. So as people feed back to us, we're, you know, it's very interactive. So we love the, you know, 
the community out there that's um, working with us. The data collected is shared with the NHS and the UK government to assist in keeping them up to date on infection rates and locations. We also worked out the estimated numbers of people in the population with it using this prediction of the symptoms equating to the tests. And that worked out that in the UK at its peak, we had about 2.1 million people at that point in time who were infected. So we think it should give the government confidence that rates in the population continue to drop. We send these results every day to the government, so they are finding them useful. They've got to make a decision about what percentage of the population they're allowed to be infected before people go back. It's currently fallen below 1%, and in some parts of the country, it's around one in 300 people. And it may be that once you get to one in a thousand, that might be the time you say, okay, uh, we can open those areas up. They're also developing an algorithm to determine if a user has the virus based on their symptoms. So the idea is that you can look at their symptoms and say, okay, this combination of symptoms means you're quite likely to have a positive test. I think when we looked at it, people reporting really strong loss of smell and taste. Um, and we found that that's the number one most predictive uh, factor in having a positive test. We hope to be able to tell you in the future, you've got a 70% probability of, if you were swapped today, of being positive, which I think is, is going to be really important in the next uh, few months. So it's been an amazing journey and it's now the biggest health citizen science project ever. We didn't know if this was going to be a sprint or a marathon in March and it's turning, it looks like much more of a marathon. So I think we need to start, you know, just slow down a bit and um, try and work out exactly uh, what the long-term thing is and how we, how we build this around all the other data streams that are out there. Testing has frustrated many all over the world, but a little town in California decided to take matters into their own hands. Bellinus residents Yuri Engstrom and Cyrus Harmon read about the Italian town of Vaux, which saved many lives by testing their whole population. But what to do when you're being told that there are no tests? Surprisingly, what happened was when we talked to uh, people and labs, uh, they said, oh, actually, we do have capacity to run tests. And we even got uh, approached by manufacturers of tests who said, here, um, you know, we have tests available. Uh, would you like to have some? And that seemed odd because, you know, it didn't match with the narrative out there that tests were incredibly difficult to get, right? And so... What slowly real, what we realized was what was missing was the testing part. Um, the, you know, physically, no one was actually going end to end and creating places where you could test entire populations quickly and affordably. And so being entrepreneurs, we started looking around and we found wedding tents that we actually set up right here um, behind me at, on this dirt field. We found, you know, masks and protective suits for the testers from local hardware stores. We found basically every single component that was required to test the entire town in a matter of days, a couple of weeks, and assembled them together with this incredible surge of volunteerism. You know, people just threw themselves into the project when they realized it was possible. And so it was really a beautiful thing. Now we're, we're rolling this out in other towns. So we're talking to a bunch of other 
other townships. Uh, the neighborhood of the Mission District in San Francisco is now being tested with the same protocol, up to 6,000 people there using the same system. And so I'm excited because it looks like what's happening now is the conversation has dramatically changed pretty much overnight. Los Angeles announced that they're going to open up free testing for everyone in LA. It's happening, you know, and so I, I'm, I'm, I'm pumped up about that. So the results are going to come through soon. What, you know, how will that information be used? Because when you first started testing, you didn't even have any confirmed cases. So are you going to be used as a test case a little bit like Vo? Yeah, I think that what's going to happen is um, I'm very hopeful that we're going to find zero active virus uh, cases. But then it's going to be interesting to see if people here have developed antibodies. Um, really what it's going to teach us, I hope, is whether the social distancing measures are working as expected and help us make decisions about opening up the town, right? I guess the other thing I want to raise is that you know, people who might be watching say, oh good, I can just get on the phone. But there was an, an outlay of, of money. I have read that you know you took part in that. And it, it, the project has cost around 365,000 US dollars. Is that correct? Yeah. And you know, is this what it takes to, to sort of make this happen? Yeah, I threw up a uh, crowdfunding campaign on GoFundMe and yeah, I just started raising money. Um, we got originally, very early on, one major check. Uh, a local entrepreneur, Mark Pincus, said, great, if you actually do this, I will match up to $100,000. But all in all, 93% of the donations were under $5,000. We had almost 200 people donate on the, on the campaign. Um, so it was very much a crowdfunded campaign. And if you look at the cost of it, I just heard from another doctor that the cost of a single intensive care unit patient with corona here is roughly the same amount. So if by testing the entire town, almost 2,000 people, we managed to save one person from going into ICU, then it would have paid itself back. We all know the impact the COVID-19 pandemic is having on our physical health. But what about our mental health? Emma Keeling with this report. Lockdown, where the door to our home has become the door to our entire world. From reports of post-traumatic stress in health workers to trauma and anxiety felt by children. Why is this pandemic proving to be as much a battle of the mind as it is of the body? Professor Dame Till Wikes has described the pandemic as a national trauma. We've got data from China and from Italy. All of them show exactly the same thing, that about half the people are really showing quite severe forms of anxiety during this period of lockdown. And it is a normal experience to have um, when you can see how many people uh, become ill, but also the, the sorts of uh, social supports that you might have, like a hug from somebody, is actually a, you know, somebody who's near and dear to you who is not living in the same household is now a threat more than a support. Is the adjusting side of things, is that what's really driving people to have sort of maybe more mental health problems or, or stresses? The stresses like financial stresses because you may not be earning as much money or you may not be earning any money at the moment or having small children at home or even large children at home can be stressful when you've only usually seen them for short periods of time. And it's particularly a problem if, if the family is also trying to homeschool. Um, all of those are stresses which are abnormal. I think it's very difficult to adjust to those stresses unless you just decide that you have, you should think that you can commit less to work activities because of all these other issues. The pressure has also been keenly felt by health workers. Recently, Dr. Zahid Chohan's friend, Dr. Saad Al Dubaisi, passed away after contracting COVID-19. Well, we had his funeral and we were busy with the funeral, but that did not mean that 
I had to stop everything else. We still needed to carry on with everything else. But actually, impact it has on your own mental health and well-being. Um, putting your colleague into a grave with your own hands, who you've been working with, who contracted COVID virus, and two hours later, going and dealing with COVID virus patient is not it's not easy. And then subsequently, four hours later, going home and trying to spend some time with your daughters or son or your wife, uh, it brings a lot of thoughts in your mind. Um, the fact of losing your friends, so I have colleagues who are on ventilator who I know personally, uh, and, and thinking what they're going through, what their families are going through uh, while they're trying to do, do their job and they're not being selfish and they put themselves forward. Uh, it, it, it does worry you if I sit here and say, no, it does not worry me. Of course it worries me, I'm a human being. It's too soon to know the mental toll coronavirus is taking on health workers as data varies from country to country. But some studies suggest between 30 to 40 per cent of frontline workers will suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms. PTSD is commonly linked with war veterans. It can be triggered when a person is exposed to traumatic events. Symptoms can include anxiety, flashbacks, nightmares and difficulty sleeping. Psychiatrist Professor Neil Greenberg has worked for years in crisis response and understands the pressures involved. So we've been hearing reports that this is PTSD has been affecting health workers on the front line in the UK. I mean, is, is this the case and what can be done to help them? Well, actually, I mean, healthcare work has always been pretty um, traumatic at times, but there's no doubt that actually some of them do get affected and they do unfortunately develop mental health conditions like PTSD. Now, at the moment, obviously, we've got a lot of trauma going on. We've not only got the fact that there's death and dying, but there's also what's called moral injury. So that's the injuries that result from not being able to do the right thing when you wanted to. Maybe you didn't have the right safety equipment. Maybe you didn't have the right number of staff or the right training. Um, or maybe there were too many patients at one time. And medical personnel uh, and all sorts of healthcare workers want to really do the best for their patients. And when they're prevented from doing so because of the situation, that can cause them to have some really difficult emotions like shame or guilt or even anger. And so what we know is actually both trauma and moral injury are affecting our healthcare staff right now. And although it's probably a bit early to say quite how many of them are gonna be affected, we would suspect that, it, that, that absolutely quite a significant number will be. I think it's important to say, though, that many people who develop these symptoms um, don't always go on to have a persistent illness. And all the evidence we have from our, our studies of um, trauma-exposed organisations done at King's College London shows that actually the most protective bit uh, of being uh, at work is actually having a really supportive colleagues and a supervisor who really is able to have a psychologically savvy conversation. And that actually, if you feel well supported and you feel you've got the support, particularly of your supervisor, actually many people can endure really quite a lot of trauma and actually come through it relatively unscathed. But Professor Wikes is concerned about the big drop in child referrals to mental health services and in accessible services for sufferers of anxiety and depression. It may be that they've created a support network around themselves so that they don't have to necessarily use uh, formal mental health services where they're getting mental health support. Um, but we are worried. We're worried about the people who already have a mental health problem but are stable. And perhaps this trauma that they've experienced will actually mean that they will have um, another episode of a serious mental illness, which will definitely require input from psychologists and potentially from psychiatrists as well. We know that social support is amazingly protective of mental health. So maybe the blueprint going forward isn't just to think about how many psychologists, psychiatrists, mental health nurses should we have per population. It's also thinking about how do we strengthen the sense of community and mutual support? Because if we do that, actually that will prevent a number of people having to go forward and getting that specialist care. And so I think actually we have kind of here an opportunity to try and make something really positive out of this. And I, I really hope that, that that does happen going forward. That's it for this Razor COVID-19 special. Look after yourselves, stay safe, and we'll see you next week.